a reminder. I'm, I'm going to keep it short because I know we're, we're a wee bit pushed for time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work and where I'm based and, and kind of where Bradson sort of fits in with us. I, I work for a Methodist church. I'm not a Methodist myself. I'm a Presbyterian, but um, I started working for them in 2012. There's been a Methodist church on the Newton Arms Road where I'm based at East Belfast. Um, for almost 200 years, we've had a presence there. In the 1980s, they became a Methodist mission and although I wasn't part of their church, I, like many other people in that community, used the mission. Um, we went along, we got fed, they did a job club, we got second-hand clothes, they, we got help that we needed, especially during the 80s when there was a time of very high unemployment. Now, the organisation, East Belfast Mission, is housed in what is the Skamos building, and that was built in 2012 and the work of the mission happens there. So what does the mission do? Well, they help the homeless, they have a homeless centre, they do free counselling, they have a big employability um, project where they train people, they get people back into work, they have a homework club, they do youth work, they work with elderly people, they provide, I think it's 100 odd metres and wheels every day, they run a big social economy project where they teach people to upgrade furniture and then they sell that on and that money comes back into the mission. And when you drive down the Newton Arch Road where I'm based, the Skamos building has a big impact on you because the, the area itself, you know, was built at the sort of turn of the century, little red brick terraced houses built for the men who, who moved from all over Ireland actually, families came for work at the shipyard and the rope works and the linen mill. And now the Skamos building stands out as a big modern build that's got a big garden wall. I'm told it's the only one in Ireland. And it was built with European money. That's how we got it. Now to say that it has changed people's lives, probably saved people's lives, is not too much of an exaggeration. Where we're based, it's the area that I was born into, brought up in, has very high unemployment, has very low rates of educational attainment, suffers from addiction, high rates of suicide, poor health. In fact, if you live in the area around where I'm based, you live on average 10 years less than if you live a few miles out of town. In the middle of this building, which we built with the European money, I, I see it, I suppose, it's really a beacon of hope. A beacon of hope in what is a very desolate landscape. And it's become the centre of many, many people's lives. It's where they go to for help. It's where they go to for hope. It's their social life. It's where they eat every day. And I work, I'm based in this building, I, I run an Irish language centre in this building and that has become very iconic as well. We are a loyalist area and if you understand the politics of Northern Ireland, then Irish language and loyalism don't seem to sit very well together. And when we started our centre five years ago, there was some people who were shocked. Um, there was talk of protests and all sorts of things, which never happened, I have to say. We have been tolerated, we have been accepted. There are some people who are hostile to us because we promote the Irish language, because we're in favour of an Irish language act, which seems to go against everything else that unionism says. But people don't often recognise there is diversity within unionism. Um, through the years of the Troubles, people were afraid to say something that made them stand out from the crowd, that differed from what the rest of the community we're saying. And so I suppose in some ways people think we're courageous because we're saying, well actually, we don't think that, we don't agree with that, we don't believe that, we believe something different. And thankfully they don't shoot you for it anymore. <laughs> but sometimes they do things like they don't speak to you anymore. They ignore you, they undermine you, they try to link you with Sinn Féin and all sorts of things to, um, I suppose take away from the message that you're providing. So 
what we do when we are very consistent in our message. And we keep saying the same thing, that the language belongs to everybody, that we don't discriminate on people's religious or political outlooks. We respect them, even if they differ from our own. And I remember the night before I started the job, it, it was a, a very important time for me. I'd left my job and I, I was starting this new piece of work as an Irish language development officer. I lived on Newton Arch Road, I lived behind East Belfast Mission, and my husband says, Linda, we're going, not going to have any windows if you keep this up. <laughs> the windows stayed, they get hit with eggs and things, but nothing more, thankfully. Well, I got up the first morning of my job, it was the, the 3rd of September 2012, and I decided I'd have a look at what was the, the daily reading for that day. And it said, be not always wanting some other work to do, but gratefully perform the task the Lord has given you. And that no matter who pays your paycheck, that you're really working for God. And I personally believe, and I respect that not everybody has a faith, but I personally believe that that's why we have been massively successful in what some people see as very unfertile ground. Because I don't read anywhere in the Bible where it talks about hating your neighbour. I, I don't see it. Now, my family are communists. I come from a very, very political background. I come from a background where we were told there was no God. God didn't exist. But life taught me something very different. And I suppose that's why I do have a faith. I suppose in some ways I connected with the talk about Brexit as well, because one of the things that happened during the referendum, which I think there was a lot of misinformation provided, um, a lack of clear information, and I, I think what Mark did today was very good. It was concise, it was on the button, and it was understandable for people. Where people got a lot of, as I say, just confusing information poured at them. And one of the things that I felt very strongly about at the time was that a lot of people were reacting, not all by any means, but a lot of them were reacting on the grounds of racism. We want to put a stop to immigration. There was no recognition of the, the good that immigrants have brought into our country. And as somebody who grew up in Northern Ireland throughout the Troubles, I didn't see anybody with a black face because people didn't come from other countries. And I remember the first time, and I was an adult, and I was in a shopping centre when I saw the first black person I'd ever seen, and I stopped and stared at them because it was so different to me. And thankfully, we live in a country now that is much more cosmopolitan. There are people from all different parts of the world. And I was an English teacher for a while, and a lot of my students were Polish, they were from all different parts of the world. And I found they had a great work ethic, because a lot of them had struggled to get to Northern Ireland to make a better life for themselves. And they brought something very valuable to Northern Ireland. They had a great work ethic. I think that's something to be celebrated, something to be encouraged. I have a friend who was a bed manager in the Ulster Hospital, and she said that the hospital couldn't have run without the Filipino nurses. And yet here we were being told to make a decision to keep people out, to keep people, the very people that were helping us, the very people that are paying into our system, to keep them out and to stop them coming. I don't think that was very sensible. I didn't vote. Something I regret now. Why did I not vote? Because I didn't understand what I was voting for or what I was voting against. I heard people like the Workers' Party saying there's a lot of issues with the EU, which I understand there is. We need to get out of it. I heard people in the DUP saying we need to get out of it, and that confused me terribly when I heard Eamon McCann and Geoffrey Yang, or Gregory Campbell, an agreement. It's not something you hear very often in Northern Ireland. And I made the decision not to vote. And as I say, I do deeply regret that now. So where are we? Well, ever since the re result of the referendum, I, like a lot of other people, feel that we're just hurtling along to something unknown. Some people say this is a positive thing, you know, it's going to open up all these new opportunities for us new doors. Some people say it's going to be a disaster, it's going to create great hardship. 
And I suppose the reality is that we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. <coughs> now who would make that decision? Who would jump when you don't know what's on the other side? And yet that's exactly what we have done. Over the last number of months, there's been talk of hard border, soft border, border in the Irish Sea. There are fears that it will create a constitutional crisis, could lead to the breakdown of the Good Friday Agreement, an agreement that was very hard won, very, very hard won. And for people who live on the border, I'm from Belfast, we don't think about the border, we don't think about those issues. But for people who are on the border, for the farmers, for the business people, they all greatly fear what the repercussions of the Brexit will mean for them. Now the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted against Brexit. They voted to stay in, but because it was a UK-wide vote, that doesn't count. The DUP, who are one of the largest parties, they campaigned for Brexit. And now we discover that they were paid to campaign for Brexit, but they're refusing to reveal where the money came from. Even within the political parties, the British political parties are very divided over Brexit, and although the Tories and Labour try to put on a united front, I don't think they're really fooling anybody. There's all sorts of fallouts. We can see there's a lot of political plotting which is becoming more and more public by the day. I just feel politicians are playing with people's lives. And it's our children and our grandchildren who will pay the price ultimately. Go on.